Income tax 2021-2022, education credits, adjusted qualified education expenses. Get ready to get refunds to the max, diving into income tax 2021-2022. Most of this information can be found in the Form 8863-2021 instructions on the IRS website, irs.gov, irs.gov. Income tax formula, we're down here in the credit area of the formula, noting that both deductions and credits are good, but if you had a dollar deduction versus a dollar credit, the credit would typically be better because you get the full dollar worth of credit, whereas the dollar deduction would be just a decrease to the tax or income and then the tax would be calculated upon it. The credits are typically broken out into two categories, non-refundable credits, refundable credits, non-refundable credits not typically taking the tax liability below zero, whereas the refundable credits may, and if did, then it wouldn't really be a refund you're getting at that point, even though it might still be called a refund. It's more like a benefit program at that time. We also might have some credits that have a non-refundable and refundable component to them. This is the form 8863, the education credits form, American Opportunity Credit, Lifetime Learning Credit. Remember that we kind of combine those, squish them together here because we want to see if we have qualifying expenses. If we could first qualify for the American Opportunity Credit because it's typically better, giving us more benefit. And then if we can't get it, we go for the Lifetime Learning Credit. That's the general thought process. Page two of the form 1040. We're flowing into, this is the non-refundable section or component. It would flow into Schedule 3 and then to line 20 on page 2 of the Form 1040, amount from Schedule 3. And then this is the bottom of the Form uh, 1040, page 2. This is the refundable section where we have line 29, the American Opportunity Credit from Form 8863. So education credits adjusted qualified education expenses. For each student, reduce their qualified education expenses paid in 2021 by, by or on behalf of that student under the following rules. The result is the amount of the adjusted qualified education expenses for each student. So example number one, last year your child graduated from high school and enrolled in college for the fall semester. You and your child meet all the other requirements to claim the American Opportunity Credit, and you need to determine adjusted qualified education expenses to figure the credit. Your child has $5,000 of qualified education expenses and $4,000 of room and board. Your child received a $5,000 Pell Grant and took out a 2750 student loan to pay these expenses. You paid the remaining $1,250. The Pell Grant uh, by its terms may be used uh, for any of these expenses. So the Pell Grant you could use for any of the expenses that were uh, taken into consideration here. If you and your child chose to apply the Pell Grant to the qualified education expenses, it will qualify as tax-free scholarship under the rules discussed in Chapter 1 of Publication 970. So now you've got this Pell Grant. The Pell Grant then was used to pay for possible education expenses and so you got kind of free money that you're not having to pay income taxes on because you got the money, didn't have to record it as income. Then you, you're thinking the government is going to be thinking, well, then you shouldn't really be able to use that money that then you then paid for the education expenses because you'd be kind of like double dipping. You got free income to pay for the expenses. And then you, and then you, if you were able to get the uh, credit for it too, that would be kind of like getting two benefits from the same thing. And so that's what they typically try to stop people from doing because that because that just makes sense so your child won't include any part of the pell grant in uh, gross income so after reducing qualified education expenses by the tax-free scholarship uh, you will have zero that's five thousand minus five thousand of a just adjusted qualified education expenses available to figure your credit your credit will be zero so that seems fairly straightforward, but let's it's a little bit more nuanced than, than we might think because notice how they kind of qualified this. They said your child has 5,000 of qualified education expenses and 4,000 of room and board. Now the, Pell, the grant that they're getting, they're saying you can apply then the grant to things like the room and board. That's kind of what the Pell Grant was provided for, but the room and board for the purposes of the credit is is going to be a personal expense so not typically something that you can include so even though you're basically saying i took the pell grant and applied part of it to the the room and board 
you're, we're still saying that you're going to have to, for the credit purposes, you got to apply it basically to the credit. So you can see what happened here. Your child received a 5000 grant and took out a 2000 uh, 750 student loan to pay these expenses, which include the 4000 of room and board, which for the credit purposes is kind of like a personal expense. You paid the remaining uh, 1250 So the Pell Grant by itself may be used for any of these expenses. So that's the key. The grant can be used for any of them, but the you can only you can't use all of them for the calculation of the uh, amount that you paid and so therefore you got to use the grant to reduce the five thousand that's why you end up with the zero amount here because you're removing that kind of room and board component so in essence if you get the grant then oftentimes that might result in you having to lower the amount that you would otherwise be including in the payments for the qualified expenses uh, example two, the facts are the same as in example one. If unlike example one, you and your child chose to apply only $1,000 of the Pell Grant to the qualified education expenses and to apply the remaining $4,000 to room and board, only $1,000 will be qualifying as uh, a tax-free scholarship. So uh, your child will include the 4,000 applied to room and board in gross income, and it will be treated as earned income for purposes of determining whether your child is required to file a tax return. If the 4,000 is your child's only income, your child won't be required to file a tax return. So after reducing qualified education expenses by the tax-free scholarship, you will have 4,000, 5,000 minus 100, to of adjusted uh, qualified education expenses available to figure your credit. Your refundable American Opportunity credit will be $1,000. Your non-refundable credit uh, may be as much as $1,500, but depends on your tax liability. Now, this might be a beneficial way to go if like you don't have a lot of income, for example, because you have that refundable portion of the credit. So the fact that you're going to you're going to have to record 4000 of what would have been uh, income that wouldn't be subject to tax as income isn't a big deal if your income is quite low and uh, you and then you might be able to get access then to the refundable portion of the credit by being able to apply that amount to the credit. So if you're not otherwise required to file a tax return, you should file it to get the refund of your 1000 refundable credit, but your tax liability and non-refundable credit will uh, be zero. Note the result may be different if your child has other income or if you're the student. If you're the student and you claim the earned income credit, that's the other big refundable credit, Choosing not to apply a Pell Grant to qualified education expenses may decrease your earned income credit at certain income levels by increasing your adjusted gross income. Now notice that that earned income is uh, that earned income credit actually goes up to some degree as your earned income goes up and then it flattens off and it goes back down. So the fact that now you have this kind of situation where you have this money, which you can either apply one way and it would basically be resulting in uh, non-taxable income and if you apply it another way that could result in it being included in income may have an impact on your earned income uh, credit which actually goes up as earned income goes up and then it flattens off and, and then it goes back down so it's another kind of thing that you can you can test out and that's useful to have software to kind of look into that unlike a scholarship or fellowship grant a tax-free distribution from a coverdale esa or qualified tuition program section 529 plan can be applied to either qualified education expenses or certain other expenses such as room and board without creating a tax liability for the student so if you put money into the to the coverdale esa then it's it's a little bit different then it doesn't really matter it's designed that thing that tool is designed to pay for these items including the room and board so you don't have to then if applying it to the room and board do what we just talked about which would be included in income in that instance an education credit can be claimed in the same year uh, the beneficiary takes a tax-free distribution from a coverdale uh, ESA or qualified tuition program as long as the same expenses aren't used for both benefits. For details there, you can take a look at publication 970, chapter uh, seven and eight. You can find that on the IRS website. Tax-free educational assistance treated as a refund. Some tax-free educational assistance received after 2021 may be treated as a refund of qualified education expenses paid 
in uh, 2021. This tax-free educational assistance uh, is any tax-free educational assistance received by you or anyone else after 2021 for qualified education expenses paid on behalf of a student in 2021 or attributable to the enrollment at an eligible educational institution during 2021. If this tax-free educational assistance is received after 2021, but before you file your 2021 income tax return, see refunds received after 2021, but before your income tax return is filed later. If this tax-free educational assistance is received after 2021 and after you file your 2021 income tax return, see refunds received after 2021 after your income tax return is filed later. So you can see where this kind of problem comes into play. If you've got the refund that happens, then the question is, well, did the refund take place in the same tax year and you knew about it, which means you could take it into consideration in the same tax year or is it something that happened after you filed the return, in which case that you might have different circumstances to take care of it in, or, or think about what to do with it in the following tax year. Refunds. A refund of qualified education expenses may reduce qualified education expenses for the tax year or may require you to repay or recapture the credit that you claimed in an earlier year. So you can imagine what happens here. It's similar with like the state tax refunds we talked about. If you, if you get a benefit in the current tax year and then in the next tax year, you get a refund. Well, now you, you got a benefit from the credit in the prior year and then you didn't really spend that money because you got a refund. So what do you do at that point? Do you amend the prior tax year to fix the fact that you didn't really pay that money? Or more likely, we would like to fix it in the current year when you got the refund. So some tax-free educational assistance received after 2021 may be treated as a refund. See tax-free educational assistance earlier. Refunds received in 2021. So we're talking about 2021 tax year and you got the refund in 2021. For each student, figure the adjusted qualified education expenses for 2021 by adding all of the qualified education expenses paid in 2021 and subtracting any refunds of those expenses received from the eligible educational institution during 2021. So if you got a refund, you might have to ask the institution, say, hey, is this refund included in my documentation that you provided to me or not? Did you already do the decrease? Hopefully my form, the 1098T, is properly calculated by the institution. But if not, then you then you got to take that into consideration. Refunds received after 2021, but before the income tax return is filed. So now it's you haven't filed tax return 2021. You got the refund in 2022, but you have not yet filed. If anyone receives a refund after 2021 of qualified education expenses paid on behalf of a student in 2021 and the refund is received before you file your 2021 income tax return, reduce the amount of qualified education expenses for 2021 by the amount of the refund. So you should still be able to take care of it in the tax year when you're filing for the credit 2021. That would be the easiest thing to do usually. Refunds received after 2021 and after the income tax return is filed. So now you got the refund in 2022 and you already got the benefit of the amount that was paid in 2021. If anyone receives a refund after 2021 of qualified education expenses paid on behalf of a student in 2021 and the refund is received after you file your 2021 income tax return, you may need to repay some or all of the credit that you claimed. You can see the cre re credit recapture calculation. So here it is, the credit recapture calculation, paying it back. If any tax-free educational assistance for qualified education expenses paid in 2021 or any refunds of your qualified education expenses paid in 2021 is received after you file your 2021 income tax return, you must recapture, repay any excess credit. So you do this by uh, refiguring the amount of your adjusted qualified education expenses for 2021 by reducing the expenses by the amount of the refund or tax-free educational assistance. So basically, you got to go back in and say, okay, what if my if I recalculate it on the proper amount after I take into consideration this refund, then I'll figure what that is that what that amount is. You then figure your educational credits for 2021 and figure the amount uh, by which your 2021 tax liability would have uh, increased if you had claimed 
uh, the re refigured credits. So what would my tax liability be if I took this refund into consideration in tax year 2021? Include that amount as an additional tax for the year refund or tax-free assistance was received, most likely in 2022. So we're not going to amend the prior tax return, but we're going to go back to the prior tax return calculation, calculating the credit under the 2021 rules after having taken into consideration the refund as if we got the refund in 2021 and then try to fix it in 2022 by adding it to other taxes. Example, you paid $8,000 tuition and fees in December 2021 for your child's spring semester beginning January 2022. You filed your 2021 tax return on February 2nd, 2022 and claimed a lifetime learning credit of $1,600. That's 8,000 qualified education expense paid times 20%. You claimed no other tax credit. After you filed your return, your child withdrew from two courses and you received, dang kid, what was what's wrong with that kid i paid and it's okay it's okay whatever you claim no other tax credits after you filed your return your child withdrew from two courses and you received a refund of 1400 you must figure your 2021 lifetime learning credit using 6600 so then if you got your refund now you got to refigure it because because the, they didn't finish this thing i paid for and anyway 8,000 qualified education expenses minus the 1,400 refunded. The refigured credit is 1,320 and your tax liability increased by uh, $280. So I got to recalculate it. I'm at the 280. You must include your difference of 280, which is the 1,600 credit originally claimed minus the 1,320 refigured credit as additional tax on your 2022 income tax return. So see the instructions for your 2021 income tax return, determine whether to include this tax. Tip, if you paid qualified education expenses in both 2021 and 2022 for an academic period that begins in the first three months of 2022, uh, and you receive tax-free educational assistance or a refund as described above, you may choose to reduce the qualified education expenses you paid in 2022 instead of reducing the qualified education expenses paid in 2021, if you're in that kind of cutoff overlap area. Eligible educational institution, what is that? What, what are those things? What's a qualified institution? An eligible educational institution is generally any accredited public nonprofit or proprietary private college, university, vocational school, or other post-secondary institution. Also, the institution must be eligible to participate in a student aid program administered by the Department of Education. Virtually all accredited post-secondary educations meet this definition. An eligible educational institution also includes certain educational institutions located outside the United States that are eligible to participate in a student aid program administered by the Department of Education. Tip. An educational institution should be able to tell you if it is an eligible educational institution. So you might want to get a third party and not be completely reliant on the person that you're going to be paying the tuition to. But the, el <laughs> the educational institution is usually well aware that they qualify as an educational institution and willing to inform you of that. Uh, so, so, you know, when you're, <laughs> when you're thinking about signing up for the tuition or something... Uh, like that. So you should have an idea of that there. So ad additional information, see publication 970 chapters two and three for more information about these credits.